To many people today, churches of Christ are a puzzle. They've heard this about churches of Christ, they've heard that, and they're left wondering. Recently, Stephen Hogner, staff writer for the Houston Chronicle, visited a Church of Christ and then wrote a report. In it he says, I grew up down the street from a Church of Christ out in Odessa where it was said they didn't have an organ and music of any kind was forbidden. My friends and I thought this particularly weird since we could not fathom a church without music. For years that small Church of Christ remained entrenched in my mind as a religious enigma, which for some reason I cannot explain, I fear. I carried this misperception with me until last Sunday when I visited the Church of Christ for the first time. Odd, but this service shot me back to my West Texas roots as nothing in Houston has ever done. In the article, he tells of his favorable impression and then closes by saying, I think I owe that small Church of Christ in Odessa an apology. It's possible that some of you have wondered about Churches of Christ. Well, we've prepared a program today that will hopefully answer some questions that you may have about Churches of Christ. In this particular program, we're going to be illustrating these matters by sharing some scenes with you from a congregation where I work, the Round Trail Church of Christ, located in the greater Fort Worth area. The first question that might be asked is, what's the distinctive plea of Churches of Christ? Well, our first great plea is a very important one, we believe, the restoration of New Testament Christianity. And the second is tied to it, the uniting of all believers in the one non-denominational church established by Jesus. Now you may wonder, what do we mean by the church of the first century and the restoration of that church and the church established by Jesus Christ? Let me emphasize this morning that when I speak of the church of Christ, I'm speaking of that church belonging to Jesus, established by Jesus, on the first Pentecost after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost. Now the members of that church were not perfect, but in inspired teaching and in approved practice it was perfect. Because God had planned it, Ephesians the third chapter, verse 10 and 11. Jesus had instituted it, Matthew 16, 18, 19. He was its reigning head, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And the Holy Spirit had given that divine pattern by which they could be guided. John the 14th chapter and also the book of Hebrews and other references. Well, it's a matter of history, unfortunately, that men were not satisfied to leave that church exactly as God had given it. Paul mentioned in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, that men would depart from the faith, and that's what happened. Finally, as the years went by, however, people rebelled against the excesses of that apostate church. And in the 1500s, we have the Protestant Reformation. It was a great concept, but unfortunately, this too resulted in division and many splinter groups. And that concept of that one perfect church established by Jesus was largely lost sight of. Well, as a result of this, through the years, in all parts of the world, from time to time, there came movements to restore the Church of the New Testament. In our own country, this occurred in the 1800s. And today, Churches of Christ are trying to stand where the Church of the first century stood, trying to be what they were in every, in every possible way. One illustration of this might be the designation that we wear. Now, in Acts the fourth chapter, in verse 12, Paul spoke of the name of Christ, when he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby or wherein we must be saved. As a body of people, we try to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, verse 17, as we wear simply the name of Christ. Notice the last part of Romans chapter 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. For instance, uh, the congregation where I work is known as the Brown Trail Church of Christ. Brown Trail is just an area designation since the building's located on that street. The Apostle Paul used area designations such as the city or the area in which a congregation was located. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. 
We also wear the name of Christ as individual members of the church, as we call ourselves simply Christians. For two-thirds of the word Christian is Christ. Reading from the last part of Acts 11th chapter, verse 26, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Another illustration of our desire to restore New Testament Christianity is in the matter of organization. Now, the organization of the New Testament church was characterized by simplicity. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11.3, spoke of the simplicity that is in Christ. In New Testament times, there was no organization larger than the local congregation. There were no state organizations, no national organizations, no international organization. Even so, today, churches of Christ are bound together only by love, and the only headquarters we have are in heaven itself. Within the local congregation, the New Testament speaks of two kinds of officers. First of all, there were the elders, also known as the bishops or pastors, Acts chapter 20, verse 17 and 28. These had the oversight of the congregation. Then there are the deacons, Philippians, the first chapter, verse 1. They're just the servants of the church. That's what the name means. And these are under the elders, Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and verse 17. And churches of Christ today were still trying to restore that pattern. Here's a picture of the leaders of the congregation where I work. We have eight elders, also known as bishops or pastors, who look after the welfare of the congregation. We also have a fine group of deacons who serve the congregation. At present, about 20 men serve in this capacity at Brown Trail. As to my own position, I'm just a preacher, a minister, an evangelist. I too am under the elders, Hebrews 13, verse 17. I'm not a pastor. Certainly I'm not a reverend. I'm not on a par with God. Psalm 111, verse 9. Well, the pattern of organization is so simple, but it is also adequate. In New Testament times, with no organization bigger than the local church, the gospel was taken to the entire world. And today, with no ecclesiastical machinery, churches of Christ are still preaching the gospel around the world. You see, the pattern is adequate. Well, we could give other examples of this concept of restoring New Testament Christianity, but that which will probably come home to most people is the matter of worship. This is what people come the nearest to see. Worship in New Testament times, like the matter of organization, was so very, very simple. It was designed not to entertain man, but rather to glorify God. It had two very important aspects. Jesus said in John the fourth chapter, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, to worship in spirit has to do with the attitude we have as we worship, and to worship in truth has to do with doing the right things that God has asked us to do. In John the 17th chapter, verse 17, Jesus prayed to God, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. For our worship to be pleasing to God, it has to involve both our hands and our heart, both our acts and our attitude. Let me now take you briefly through a typical Sunday morning service at a Church of Christ. Let me tell you what we do and why we do it as we attempt to restore New Testament worship. The first expression of worship I want to notice is that of prayer. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, we have this short command, pray without ceasing. That prayer was a part of New Testament worship is very obvious. They had special prayer services, Acts 12, 12, and prayer was also a part of their regular services, Acts the 20th chapter, verse 36. Today, as in the case of New Testament times, one man leads the hearts of the congregation in prayer, 1 Corinthians the 14th chapter, verse 15 and 16. To this public prayer, each person in his own heart adds his own personal petition in Amen, 1 Corinthians the 14th chapter, and verse 16. Now there are no set prayers, no prayer books used in churches of Christ. You see, no set prayer can ever really express the attitude of any leader or the people who are present. A prayer needs to be as personal as a handshake or a kiss of love. And again, set prayers tend to become ritualistic, little more than form. 
Jesus said in Matthew the sixth chapter and verse seven, when you pray, use not vain or empty repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Perhaps the most important thing though that I can say about our prayer service is that we believe that every child of God can go directly to God. Every child of God is spoken of as a priest, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, and therefore send up the sacrifice of his lips and his heart personally to God. We do not go through any human being, whether preacher or priest, but rather direct our prayers to God himself through his Son, Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, the second chapter and verse 5, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The second expression of worship that I'd like to notice is that of the Lord's Supper. I suppose the thing that people notice most about our observance of the Lord's Supper is that we partake of it on the first day of every week, and that we partake of it only on the first day of the week, never on Thursday or Friday or whatever. If you were to ask why we do this, we'd simply say, well, that's the New Testament pattern. New Testament first day worship centered around the Lord's Supper. We notice in Acts the 20th chapter, verse 7, and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came to gather to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Notice it was the first day of the week and that they came together for the purpose of breaking bread. Now, since they came together on every first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, and since their worship centered around the Lord's Supper, it follows that they had the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. And that this is the case is also seen in the writings of the early Christians who described their weekly services. For instance, to quote Augustus Neander, author of the history of the Christian religion and church, as I've already remarked, the celebration of the Lord's Supper was held to constitute an essential part of divine worship every Sunday, as appears from Justin Martyr, who wrote in A.D. 150. As to the actual observance itself, it's kept as simple as when Jesus instituted it. Unleavened bread is used, for this is the kind of bread used by Jesus when he instituted the supper during the Passover feast. This bread is emblematic of the body of Christ. And the fruit of the vine is used to represent his blood shed on Calvary. As we partake, we think of Christ on the cross, his continued presence with us, and the fact that he's coming again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. At some point during the service, we take up the contribution. At Brown Trail, we generally do this immediately after the Lord's Supper as a matter of convenience. Some, some congregations, though, do it at some other point. Regarding this expression of worship, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians the 16th chapter, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Occasionally someone says to me, David, how do you folks in churches of Christ do so much? In our particular denomination, we've just tried every way we can to raise money, and we always seem to be lacking. What's your secret? Well, there really is no secret. In churches of Christ, we simply try to obey the instructions of the passage just read and give as God is prosperous. We do not have bingo games, bake sales, nor bazaars to finance the work of the church, nor do we go about soliciting contributions from those who are not our members. We believe the responsibility of financing the work of the congregation is our responsibility. And further, we believe that God's plan of financing the work of the church is adequate. I'd also mention here that we believe that we cannot buy at any particular percentage on our members. In the Old Testament, 10% was bound, but we do not bind that. It's interesting, though, many members of Churches of Christ who understand we have greater blessings than they had in Old Testament times give more than the 10% that was bound on Jews by the law of Moses. This is in accordance with the principle laid down in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Reading first of all, verse 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And then verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, 
not grudging layer of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Well, we've now noted three expressions of worship, prayer, the Lord's Supper, and giving. Up till this time, however, we've not noted the particular expression of worship that most of our visitors first note, the matter of singing without an organ, without a piano. It's sometimes said that churches of Christ do not believe in music, but we do. We believe in music and worship vocal music. Hopefully by this time you know why we sing without mechanical accompaniment. This is the pattern of the New Testament. You see, our purpose in worship is not primarily to make ourselves feel good. Our purpose in worship is to glorify God and to worship God. It is God that we must please and not ourselves. And the only way we can know what God would have us to do is to ask the question, what has he said in his word? Well, what has God said in his word in the New Testament about music in Christian worship? Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians, the third chapter and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now search the New Testament through. You will find that the New Testament church used only vocal music. Now that this is the case is also testified to by others who wrote concerning the worship in that early days. We find, for instance, Mosham writing, the Christian worship consisted in hymns, prayers, the reading the scriptures, a discourse addressed to the people, and concluded with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Edward Dickinson, in History of Music, writing of the early church, said simply, the church chant was exclusively vocal. In fact, instrumental music was never used by anyone who claimed to be a follower of Christ, and that it was used hundreds of years after New Testament times. Churches of Christ today therefore believe that we should simply do what the New Testament church did, sing and make melody in our hearts without addition or subtraction. Listen to these sobering words from Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Well, this brings us to a final expression of worship, the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. As we noted in Acts, the 20th chapter, verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. During our services, we generally have the reading of the Scriptures, even as Jesus read from the Scriptures in the synagogue. At Brown Trail, it's then my privilege to preach. This is a scene of a recent service. Two things need to be said about our preaching service, who and what. As regards the who, it will be noted that only men lead our service, including the preaching of the gospel. Paul said in the first part of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches for it's not permitted unto them to speak. Our women are to be teachers, Titus, the second chapter. The New Testament says it's not to be done in a public service. Then as regards the what? We strive not to preach ourselves, not our own opinions, not current events, not comments on the world affairs, but rather the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Paul said in Romans, the first chapter, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If you do visit a church of Christ, chances are that as a, at the conclusion of that preaching service, there will be an invitation. We do not like to close any service without asking men to search their hearts and asking them to respond to the grace of God, to the one who loved them so much, who gave himself for 
for them. Even as we offer that invitation, we try to tell men simply to do what they did in New Testament times. For instance, to those who desire salvation. We go to Mark the 16th chapter and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Or we go to Acts the second chapter and verse 38 as Peter speaks to the brethren and to those who are present. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And to those who have not been faithful in living the Christian life, we strive also to present God's message to them. James 5.16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. Or 1 John, the first chapter, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, that's the basic plea that we have, the plea of restoring New Testament Christianity. Let me again say that we believe that God's plan is adequate throughout the ages, that the church was exactly as God wanted it, and that God wants us to restore it even today. Now here's what we believe is the marvelous thing. We believe if we'll do the same things they did in New Testament times, do them for the same reasons that God will add us to the same church. Acts, the second chapter, verse 47, and he'll not add us to the wrong. God will make no mistakes. It's possible, of course, you still have further questions about churches of Christ. We have material we'd love to send you, and well, why not just go to the closest church of Christ to you and talk to them, ask them questions. They'll love to have that chance and opportunity. Now, until next week, may God bless you all very richly. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor. receive a free audio cassette of today's lesson, we'll need you to send your name and address to us at our address, which will be shown in just a few moments, and we'd be happy to send this to you so that you might study along in your own home with those things that Brother Roper has talked about today. Thank you. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by Churches of Christ. For a copy of today's program, Additional information or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at this same time for the truth in love.